Um, hello, and welcome everyone to um, today's session on uh, uh, workshop exhibition, Western North America. And I just wanted to say hello. My name is uh, Dr. Gustavo Alfonso Rincon uh, from Digital Futures World, and I'll be hosting today's event. The topic was inspired to look back at all of the incredible work undertaken in the workshops by all the incredible generosity of all of its instructors. Um, last, last summer, uh, part of my story of being here is last summer, I uh, witnessed a great uh, conference from Digital Futures and I was compelled after um, sitting there and actually watching and asking tons of questions how to join. So I would encourage people that uh, enjoyed the conference this year to please contact us and see if you wanted to join. I wanted to thank Neil Leach, the Digital Futures family, and Philip, who is here today. Um, let's, let's begin. Um, so today we're looking at the, we're looking at this um, exhibition, uh, brief introductions. There's going to be um, the workshops we're going to talk about today is Architectural Intelligence AI, Data vi Visualization with P5JS, Domestic Realities, My Living Room in Public, GANs 2D to 3D, Narratives to the Post-Anthropocene, New Veils, Couture and Architecture, and really, um, dot, 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 question mark. So, um, so far, our uh, first uh, presenters today is Govench Ozel from UCLA and Benjamin um, and Moser from Architectural Intelligence AI, Dr. Yoon Chung Han from uh, San Jose State University, Yara Fegali from UCLA, Shane Bugney and Gabriel S. Cuvel from Texas A&M University, Alex Webb from the School of Architecture, University of New Mexico, Lisa Chiang from LASG Studio presenting on behalf of Philip Beasley, And Victoria Luisa Barbo from Resonant Matter. She'll be presenting on behalf of uh, Neil Leach, uh, Stanford Quinter, um, herself, and Marina Rodriguez Das Nieves. I wanted to briefly cover this um, our press release, but also uh, our initiatives here. Our aim at Digital Futures is to democratize architectural education by making important educational ideas available for free to architects and students across the globe, regardless of gender, religion, ethnicity, age, or economic standing. Education, we believe, should be a human right and not a privilege of the wealthy. Just wanted to bring your attention to the left. Um, we had over 100 workshops all over the world, and uh, some of our production on your right on um, a bridge and from um, uh, Phillips and um, Philip Block's, uh, Philip Juan and Philip Block's uh, bridge and um, another project uh, from one of our colleagues, Nick Bow. I uh, wanted to highlight some of the winners. I also wanted to say uh, thank you. Digital Futures would like to thank all of those who contributed to making Inclusive Futures accessible event that it was, the instructors who generously gave their time for free for less privileged students around the world, the students themselves, and above all, the organizational team who self selflessly gave their time for free for the benefit of others. Digital Futures would not be possible without the generous support of our dedicated organizational team, inspiring presenters, highly skilled workshop instructors, and motivated students who selflessly give their time to explore the potential of our digital futures. If you want more information, please go to our website and find us under uh, workshops, all the information, talks, conferences. And um, if you want to get in contact, please go to 
um, the website to the FAQ. Um, let's begin with inclusive futures and uh, let's start it. So our first presenters today will be uh, Ben and uh, uh, Guvench. So are you guys ready? Mm -hmm. um, I guess I'm just gonna get started. I am Guvench Ozel. I teach at the uh, UCLA uh, Postgraduate Ideas Program. And um, I just uh, wanted to give a little bit of a short intro to the, to the goals of, and objectives and a little bit of a context to our uh, workshop. Um, let me let me talk about this. So uh, the workshop that we devised together is Architectural Intelligence, which is also the name of the first course that I taught at uh, UCLA in 2013. And uh, back then, the goal of the course was uh, primarily to uh, think about um, how we can envision a sort of an intelligence for architecture. And, um, and then there were multiple factors uh, that affected uh, the way that we have, um, um, the way that we have um, uh, envisioned that. And then mostly it was about the definition of intelligence for any kind of a being. Uh, considering that uh, that being needs to sense the environment and then understand it and then react to it. And then based on that reaction, project into future scenarios and then synth synthesize multiple different kinds of scenarios. But um, for our purposes, we kind of reduced it into two factors. One of them is interactive, the other one being generative. Uh, and the interactive part is like beyond the scope of this uh, exercise and uh, beyond the scope of the, the research that I'm going to mention today. Uh, interactive is primarily pertaining into, to cyber physical systems that have an ability to initiate change in the digital and the physical worlds. And generative is primarily looking at uh, new kind of intelligence systems that have an ability to automate and uh, autonomously uh, produce uh, new kinds of design paradigms. So in the workshop, uh, we, we initially gave a little bit of a scientific context about how artificial neural networks work, um, what kind of uh, networks are generally available for um, the, user, the use of designers. And, uh, and I think that was really important uh, in order to, in a way, kind of understand the, 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 the computer science background of the, of, of the project so that it doesn't become purely a kind of a formal exercise. Uh, and, uh, and then we kind of uh, shifted our gears towards uh, looking into GANs uh, and uh, what, what the general use of GANs have been. And uh, in that regard, uh, we wanted to kind of also provide a little bit more uh, scientific context about why they are the way they are and uh, how designers are in a way kind of misusing them in order to intentionally, in order to produce new types of uh, aesthetic outputs. And, um, and then, you know, providing a little bit more, um, again, operational uh, information uh, for the students and then giving them uh, examples of how they operated in some of our earlier work. Uh, this project uh, called Deep City was from uh, 2018. And, um, and that was uh, one of our first kind of architectural data set uh, generative images that we have created uh, based on the uh, surveillance data. And, uh, and then that, that kind of a lack or, or absence of uh, accurate surveillance data uh, led us to a kind of a heavier use of digitally generated surveillance data, such as uh, Google Earth Studio. And that has become uh, some of the um, uh, tools that we have also devised for providing easy access to the students in the workshop uh, to, you know, in order to visualize the kind of works that they will be. Uh, producing. Again, you know, we illustrated that with some of the previous work that we have um, uh, put together uh, and creating these kind of synthetic uh, axonometric drone footage like uh, artificial uh, cityscapes. And also looking into, in a way, the purpose of different kind of uh, uh, machine learning algorithms uh, from analytical to projective to predictive, uh, you know, you know, we're also contextualizing uh, these tools for any kind of uh, 
creative to critical use, uh, meaning um, in, in, you know, it, it could be a tool for analysis, looking into existing, uh, you know, urban kind of scapes and uh, thinking about their qualities and their formal uh, features. And then it could be projective in the sense that the multiple kinds of data sets would allow for a combination of different factors that may not exist uh, currently, but that could be existing in the future. And then if, if the data sets are put together correctly, then it could be a predictive tool. For example, uh, some of the projects that we have generated in the past primarily looked into the effect of climate change and sea level rise and how that could influence different types of uh, So we provided those as examples of how they create, up, I would say, uh, fictional narratives, what they are, less fiction in the sense that they take into consideration different kinds of uh, realities uh, to project into the future. And then thinking about how that data, that two-dimensional data could be used as a template to generate three-dimensional imagery. Again, uh, providing uh, some context uh, from our previous work at UCLA. Uh, and then focusing more on the architectural scale, which was the scope of the scope of the exercise that we have provided to the students. So looking at that architectural scale, our methodology was to assign students different buildings in, in the city of Los Angeles, and then uh, have them create drone-like footage of these uh, buildings through Google Earth Studio, and then select style images uh, from a series of um, artists uh, from a list that we have provided. One of the, one of the kind of um, origins of this exercise was based on a paper that uh, Benjamin and I wrote together for Acadia 2018, uh, which was about thinking about uh, artificial neural networks as a method for uh, cross-disciplinary interaction and uh, thinking about multiple different kinds of stylistic influences to infiltrate uh, different disciplines. Uh, and uh, this kind of a transdisciplinary approach was uh, one of the primary objectives of our goals uh, to use uh, machine learning. And uh, based on that idea, we have provided uh, a list of artists to the, to the workshop students. And, uh, and uh, we used um, primarily runway ML uh, because of its uh, ability for access and speed to adjust different kinds of style weights and multiple input styles. And then there would be a consequence of feature extraction of architectural elements and then architectural style transfer on the drone footage and then position the building massing through photogrammetry and rotoscoping. And then uh, we introduced a light 3D modeling uh, approach, which was about expressing the style features uh, to go beyond just a pure image and video. Uh, and for that, we used, uh, because of the, the time frame that we had, uh, we used uh, simple uh, 3D translation techniques such as uh, bump maps and, uh, and displacement maps. And then the goal was to composite the new uh, production back into the, the primary footage so that the, the, the different buildings in their context would actually dramatically transform in their stylistic and architectural expression. Um, so, you know, everybody's aware of this process about the input image, target image, and output image, but uh, we have also provided them uh, how to calibrate information about how to calibrate different levels of uh, articulation in uh, style transfer algorithms. And for that, we have shown the uh, previous work of, uh, of our students, again, at UCLA uh, from three years ago. Um, as you can see, uh, these kinds of uh, exercises uh, were much longer than the, than the week-long exercise that we have had. But the results uh, that Benjamin is about to show is going to be quite similar to these kinds of turntable animations, uh, uh, which are 3D modeled through different kinds of procedural modeling techniques that are directly linked to the images that were produced by the, uh, by the algorithms. Uh, and like I said, uh, we have resorted to much simpler uh, uh, modeling uh, workflows in order to speed up the process in the workshop. Um, so the, the, the deliverable was that they were in a way supposed to uh, composite the, the style transferred building back into the context and also produce these uh, transformed uh, 
turntable animations of these new types of architectural expressions. And uh, without further ado, I'm going to pass the baton to Benjamin to show the results share. of uh, of what the students have produced. And without further ado, also like, um, I mean, this is our mirror board and I'm going to go into the individual steps and uh, systematic workflows uh, soon. But I would like to dive immediately into the, the video that shows the results what the students have produced over the course of that of that workshop. And as we can see here, um, this is the final result where like the students composited back the style transferred um, images and sequences into either a photogrammetry reproduced context or in uh, a, a drone footage context and like basically rotoscope scoped it into there. And I think also important to mention all the artistic influences, they are either like sculptors, painters, media artists, fashion designers, like creatives from, from adjacent fields and, uh, and uh, design disciplines that might influence the output and the result. And here we just see a series and um, like a couple of like those, those outcomes. Important also to mention, I think, is that um, this time we, we tried to capture a whole city. So in a, in a second, I'm about to show the, the strategy we were following in terms of like the, the top down view of, of uh, downtown Los Angeles. Uh, at the beginning, each student had to, had to pick a certain territory, a certain area uh, of, of downtown LA and then basically reproduce or capture them through photogrammetry in um, and, and then basically apply the style transfer. But before that, as I already mentioned, each student like was picking different kind of uh, style influences uh, from, from a list. And the goal was not just to apply one style influence, but in order to, to have like a, a true hybridization and a true uh, influx of, of, those, of those style images uh, that we are applying one, two, three, four steps of those style transfer processes, where for example, like Gerhard Richter or Murakami start to blend and emerge into something new that even the artist itself hasn't, hasn't envisioned before, or we have like um, Panton or like other like influences uh, going, going over, those, over those exercises. And as we can see through the, throughout the workshop, the most important as aspect of, of that style transfer was uh, the bigger the transformation and the building mass and the architectural elements, the better, the better or the more successful a, a result was, was basically, basically deemed. And then after that style transfer and the photogrammetry process, students were like starting to, to again, like rotoscope it into the drone footage or as well uh, creating, uh, creating singular views that, that show the style transfer uh, video. Uh, next to the fundamentals and the applications of, I would say very simple, but uh, AI, but as an introduction, I think a very compelling AI. Students also like learned how to 3D model, like how to animate, how to use game engines to create um, new, uh, new uh, visualization techniques that are like instant and real time uh, versus like um, something like that is more CPU based. But then also uh, understand that the power and the techniques and the workflows of UV mapping, texture mapping, and how to optimize geometry uh, while being not just a creator of, uh, of, of a data set, but also like uh, the, the human part of this human machine collaboration of like 3D modeling, texturing, and then situating the building, the building again. I will post the link to the mural board later where, uh, where you can see all the results of the students. But overall, we are, we are quite excited what the students have, have produced within this, this couple of days. Thank you. I mean, one thing that I would like to add uh, is that the, this kind of uh, multidisciplinary process uh, is, is really productive in the sense that it allows the, the students to contextualize much larger aesthetic, I would say, trends uh, that exist in the world of art, uh, fashion, um, any kind of industrial design production. And then it allows for streamlining a workflow where you can actually take that influence, synthesize it with other influences, and then turn them into a productive architectural expression tool. And, uh, and I think in that regard, um, 
you know, the technique that we have in a way fine tuned over the years, um, as Benjamin said, has, has produced a kind of a pretty, I would say, accurate system and a direct system that um, produces pretty compelling results pretty fast. Uh, but the more exciting part of the, of, of the, of the um, um, process is that it, it, it kind of uh, becomes uh, cumulatively a, a, a kind of, a, I would say, tool that could be applicable or used by uh, multiple different kinds of people in multiple different kinds of objectives. Thank you. Well, uh, well, I just wanted to say thank you very much for starting off today's panel. Uh, there's so much there, uh, and I actually can't wait to ask you questions. Non-disclosure, I'm a UCLA AUD grad, so I, I'm not going to pull any preferences here, but it was a very inspirational work, so thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Hyun Chung Han and her um, workshop data visualization with P5JS. Um, Yoon, uh, can you share the screen? Mm -hmm. All right, hello everyone. So I'm gonna share my screen. Um, okay, so let's see. I'll just show like this. Um, maybe I can try. Well, uh, just just to, to be brief, uh, a short introduction while Yoon starts. Uh, Dr. Uh, Yoon, uh, she's also a graduate of the Media Arts and Technology program here at UCSB. So my uh, my alma mater, uh, Yoon, has a distinguished career, has shown internationally, and also she's an incredible human being, uh, extremely wonderful instructor. And I can't speak anything more than she's incredible. So thank you, Yun. Take it away. <laughs> thank you, Gustavo. All right. Um, so my workshop was a really actually simple thing. Um, um, and then uh, there was a data visualization with the P5JS. And then uh, the thing is, you know, the visualizing data is super, you know, important in these days, right? I'm, I'm also using data as my art materials. Always, I, I believe there are so many things you can learn from data, right? So there's hidden narratives, or there's actually our lives and society, cultures, and, you know, all these kind of stories are in, in hidden in the data. And then I want to give uh, some opportunity for students to learn about it, you know, investigate something hidden, some meanings and context stories from the data. And then although actually data visualization might be super common in these days, um, I realized that not many actually students had a chance to actually make something, you know, with the data. So actually when I, um, yeah, organized this workshop and started the, uh, the selection process for students, I actually selected students uh, who never actually uh, took any, any um, courses related to data viz. So totally it was, uh, open for all levels, first of all, you know, and the beginners and the who never taken any like a uh, introductory, introductory level of, you know, data viz uh, courses in their undergrad level or grad level um, program. So um, everyone was pretty much new and then uh, that was my intention. So we can kind of um, investigate it. How can we visualize it? So it's really start from the, you know, kind of foundation uh, from, you know, in the graphic design, visual communication matter, and also engineering part. And then uh, not only just for visual, but how can we sonify, like a transform data to sound? So that was another topic. So um, yeah, it was a three day workshop. And then uh, the first day and the second day I introduced several, you know, stretches and then, you know, inspirational works. Uh, and, you know, there are so many actually incredible data based works. Uh, and also share my works. Um, yeah, so this is the uh, some of the, the demos and then um, some of the thumbnail images from the student works. Um, yeah, I think I can um, cut to the chase. I can actually share the, um, yeah, some of the works. Uh, yeah, P5J is actually is the super, yeah, incredible uh, platform uh, for definitely, you know, uh, for beginners who never actually learned the code, uh, um, no background in engineering. So it's really easy to learn and then easy to produce, yeah, visuals. Uh, and then P5J, there's an uh, editor. So um, probably uh, many people already have experience with P5J here. Um, yeah, so just only like a few like uh, lines or, you know, less than, you know, 100 lines, you can kind of simply visualize uh, the, the data. So I think that was a actually really um, cool um, benefit. 
So this was the simple demos I created. So, you know, with the um, COVID-19 data, you can simply create some kind of bar graphs and the kind of pie charts um, like this. And then some kind of interactive uh, data viz like this. Um, and there's some 3D works um, with the code, yeah, like this. So yeah, you can simply modify it and then you can easily like see the, the yeah, result here. Um, some cute, you know, demo always students like, you know, cute things. So I put the, the cat image here. Um, yeah, and there's some of the sound demos as well. Yeah, I think, let's see. Yeah, this was the demo I made it. Can you hear sound? Yes, yes, we can hear sound. Yeah, I think it's what the workshop uh, was pretty simple. So how can you interpret, you know, the data, like each single thing to the line or dots or, you know, square, and then, you know, scale, color, you know, color also tells many things. So uh, uh, we actually kind of, you know, uh, discuss a lot of things, uh, you know, what, what, you know, if you choose the red color, you know, why it should be red, you know, why is it blue or, you know, super simple thing, but it's really actually important thing, right? So for the, uh, the viewers, uh, they're gonna, you know, read it as a kind of some kind of uh, context and narrative. So what would be the best choice, you know? There's also no, you know, right answer. So um, there are a lot of actually multiple choices. So what would be the, you know, best, yeah, answer. So um, yeah, here's some, some of the results, um, the student actually. So I, the, the deliverables uh, of, of the workshop, um, where the student actually chose the, their own topics. And then uh, I asked the students to bring their own data file. It can be open data somewhere, or they can generate their data. And just uh, I asked to you know, uh, generate a CSV file and then just bring it. And then uh, they learn how to you know, split the data uh, in here um, using some of the you know, uh, methodology here. And then simply try to transform it into some simple things, you know, visual like lines or colors and yeah, circles and 2D to 3D and sound. So this was the uh, student work from Miriam. And then there's um, um, yeah, the uh, yeah, I also gave some sample data files, and then one of them was uh, the COVID-19 data. And then um, yeah, she uh, visualized uh, yeah, this data, like a death, um, the number of the death, and then the new cases and two lines here. So yeah, and then these all students actually had never um, yeah, done coding. So it was actually their first time. So it was pretty challenging and also interesting. And then yeah, some students actually really did an awesome job. So this was also another one. Um, I think this was the uh, also Miriam's work. So it's actually interactive database. So you can hover over and then um, yeah, I think it's a personal data, I think. So yeah, you can see, you know, control the hue, color, brightness, and then yeah, visualize the intensity and then, you know, data, uh, the number. And then some of the works include sound. So the, the moving animation is another like thing. So uh, I think student, uh, this student really had a fun with the you know, moving stuff. It's like a bouncing ball, but uh, you can actually, you know, tonify it and, you know, uh, change the transform the data, the sound and also scale of the uh, thing. So it's like a kind of representation of the COVID nineteen, like a virus, you know, virus like spreading out and then turn it to sound. Yeah, there was another one, and then there's another like video. Uh, the student generated. Yeah, I think what is really great thing is, you know, um, not only just for visual, there's a sound and the sound always, you know, this is really uh, based on the time. And then, you know, you can instantly recognize it, you know, uh, the, the sound based on, you know, frequency, pitch and, you know, the amplitude. 
So the, the student had a chance to, you know, uh, learn, you know, there's opportunity, you can actually sonify the data. So there's kind of audiovisual multimodal, you know, uh, interactivity. Um, and then, yeah, some new way of interpreting and transform the data. Um, yeah, I think the, uh, uh, that's all actually from my workshop. And then this was, uh, even though it was super simple and the introductory part, uh, I think uh, we actually um, yeah, had uh, many interesting conversations and uh, discussions. And then uh, I think the one actually valuable part from the workshop uh, was that, you know, this the, this was actually, you know, I think the motto of this, the whole this third world, you know, this workshop was um, this open education, free education for all. I think that was actually really, uh, um, I think you know, we achieved that, that goal from the workshop. Um, yeah, and I think also, yeah, students also not only for the, but just uh, simply like visualizing or sonifying data, they also kind of discuss about the many uh, kind of topics related to, you know, social issues, you know, the, something like this COVID-19 or uh, cultural issues. And then how can you actually really, um, yeah, talk about the, those issues um, with this kind of technology and then, um, yeah, and the data. So some of the, actually the other, yeah, so there's some, some screenshot images um, from the, uh, the workshop. Yeah, here and there. Yeah, so I think hopefully the students can come back to, uh, to the next workshop and then um, keep, yeah, going on, continuing this, this work. Yeah, I think that's it for um, my workshop. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Yoon, uh, doctor. Uh, just one question. Um, since you came from the media arts uh, uh, research paradigm, and you've also globally shown all over the world and have published and are also an active curator for like ACM, how, how, do you, how did you see this, the architectural students? How did you experience them as creators um, and as uh, makers? Because I think it's a different paradigm that you're speaking about. Can you explain a little bit about that before we move on. Sure. Yeah. Well, I think you know architecture is well. Design is you know architecture is uh, definitely you know, under the umbrella of the whole design, and then architecture you know touches a lot of extra things. You know, not just you know that building stuff, but you know you have to understand about society, cultures, and human behaviors, and then the whole like you know like all the after effects created from that the buildings and any kind of you know that the the stuff. So I think you have to know a lot of actually, you know, um, information, knowledge in the many different disciplines. So that's why I think it's really, really challenging. And then uh, that was actually also, you know, um, um, yeah, I also collaborated with the, uh, the yeah, the uh, uh, architects um, before and a lot, of, uh, I learned a lot of interesting things. And then, yeah, I think the, um, um, when actually architect and then the technology actually meet together. There are so many actually things uh, you can do. Uh, it really direct to impact to the society um, and the whole, you know, our lives. Um, and then, yeah, you can see um, there, um, yeah, even like, um, yeah, I work in the, the MIT Sensible City Lab before, like I think it's been like seven years, eight years. And then I had the chance to work with the engineers and architects and then, yeah, designers. Uh, and then what I actually did was, um, yeah, we learned about the humans, uh, um, the movement in the one building. We uh, one of the projects I worked was the uh, in the Paris. You know, there's the Louvre Museum, right? So everyone knows that museum. And then we actually um, investigate the uh, how the actually people, actually visitors, actually move around in the museum, and then what was actually discovery and things we can learn. So. I think there's a kind of interesting story you can learn. And then, you know, there's some interaction between the buildings and humans and then, you know, um, yeah, many actually other things. Um, so I think, you know, um, there are some definitely, um, um, yeah, I think there's some, um, yeah, then 3D um, printing, artificial intelligence, and then, you know, many actually computational um, technology can, yeah definitely impact to the, the, the yeah, I mean, dis disciplines. So, I mean, oh, so why we interrupted the program a little bit is um, uh, Yoon will be leaving us uh, uh, early. So do you have any questions for the panelists, the rest of the panelists or any comments before you go? <laughs> okay, well then in that case, uh, Yoon, thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate it. And hopefully there'll be more of your colleagues joining us 
And uh, I warmly invite you for next year. Thanks again for all of your work. Um, our next speaker is um, Yara. So um, please, Yara, uh, you have the stage. Yeah, sorry. Hello, everyone. Yeah, super interesting work. You have very, very interesting work. Um, I think, you know, in a way, I also uh, follow similar lines, maybe in a different, um, in different way of doing it, but also working with um, data set, working with data visualization, and mostly the workshop that I ran connecting uh, called Domestic Realities, and my living room is public uh, application is an introduction, I would say, to um, an introduction to what I do in general. So it's a short and sweet. Uh, so thank you for having me. I will uh, share my workshop background first uh, to explain why we're doing this type of work. And um, uh, it started with a class I taught at UCLA. And it's important because it started when the pandemic started when in 2020, when we had barely a week to switch to remote teaching. And then suddenly I really wanted to change the topic of the um, uh, class I was gonna teach and turn it around uh, domestic, what I call domestic realities was uh, really asking students to reflect on the, on what it means to work in a domestic space, what it means to share and um, suddenly have all their privacy being shown on a, uh, on a camera and being shared all over and also having to work and live in the same place and how that could affect or could it affect or could it have any repercussion on architecture and the way we design. Um, the means to do it was we're working with photogrammetry and through the um, through game engines. And we're extremely interested in the use of game engine in architecture, the same way if you want a software from the movie industry like Maya, we're introduced into architecture by pioneers like Greg Lynn. We're looking at game engine as the workflow that uh, comes from the game industry um, that will change the way we think about architecture, the way we design in architecture. Um, so pedagogically, I wanted students to look at the dirtiness of architecture and dirtiness in the best way, meaning their actual spaces and not, you know, the clean modernist rendering that we call architecture representation. So every student was asked to look around their house and to scan these different domestic spaces and um, they were going to be used as the basis uh, for the workshop. And we were also looking at the work of Gera Richter and how he mixes medium using in the series over painted photographs, where he uses um, a mix of abstraction through the leftover paint over uh, photographs that he took. And we were interested in that duality between abstraction, which we understood as rendering the digital renderings that we produce in architecture and studios, and uh, the realism of the spaces that we actually live in, that we encounter, that are messy and dirty, and again, in the best way. And we wanted to be in that in-between space, between that abstraction and that digital rendering, that realism and our domestic spaces as a way to domesticate architecture representation. Um, so if we take the studio, you know, standard way of thinking, which uh, like the core studio, which pedagogically starts with a concept model kit, which is any kind of, you know, different parts that you pull apart uh, or you pull together and you try to make sense of uh, volume and geometry, and then you jump to a digital model and you model it and then you cut and you create you know, a plan, a section through different cuts on a software, and then you render it and it becomes this beautiful image, and then you build it and it becomes a space. But our idea was, what if we start from that space and we do the uh, whole process backwards? So we start from your space, you 3D scan it, then you put it on your computer, it's already rendered, and then you cut and draw and you do a drawing from that. And then you try to understand from that how it becomes a digital model and then how it becomes a concept model kit, which is um, different pieces of parts that you would pull together. Um, so coming back to that living room, they were asked to scan it. And these are the results you're seeing now are uh, from the longer workshop that uh, their longer class that was run at um, UCLA. And you can see how we started to discuss like different notions of entourage, different notions of um, the entourage, which is a word used in the Beaux-Arts to define like everything that is around architecture, like uh, furniture, um, um, 
uh, light, people, anything, like the definition is anything that you would shake out of building and it is full. And we're talking about mool building, atmosphere. And somehow, since it was their domestic spaces, students were more um, automatically were more um, leaning towards, you know, adding stuff and, and having that mix of resolution between the familiar and uh, the digital, if you want. And you can see on the left, this is a group of four students and they've merged their spaces digitally, even though they're apart. As you can see on the right, they're uh, apart in their physical space. And on the left here, you see a part of the building that is being tilted and all of these different, um, you know, digital thing fall off from it and photogrammetry. And this is their way of, um, you know, doing a GIF or doing um, a vignette of what entourage is to them. Um, and the way we represented that work was, you know, as you can see these colors and this uh, very specific way of rendering it is um, as being part of propagating that world, that work into the media age um, and into, you know, all of that different aesthetics that emerged during the pandemic. Um, but not only that, we also went and looked at notion of plan representation and what would it mean to uh, draw, you know, I asked for a drawing of a plan and this, these are the drawings that I got and rethinking what does it mean in elevation, what, a, you know, a plan, elevation, ceiling plan, uh, what does it mean in terms of working with photogrammetry and how do you understand that uh, weird um, representation where you can identify a facade, but you cannot fully draw it, or it's not uh, precise enough. It's in that, again, messy digital in between, and messy in the best way, in a way that we really emphasize, um, you know, working with things that are not, you're not in full control, and there's that gap where the software itself, or the machine, or the game engine, in that case, really give back to you. And the way all of these data and these assets that we had were put is they were put in that game engine uh, designed by Polyphys, which is my practice with Vivian El Kmati. And we designed that game where they were able to input these different animated chunks, photogrammetry, but also digital um, parts. And they were able to model them and move them around to build a new space or to design a new space through that. And it's exactly that format that I used in digital futures with domestic realities. And we had a very compact version, but it was really interesting to see how students would react, you know, a year and a half later uh, after being at home and being used to, to share your interior spaces. Suddenly, you know, the results were much more <laughs> out there, like students had um, less issues with sharing interiority. We suddenly saw, you know, the emergence of people and um, there was, uh, you know, that need of putting all of these people and spaces that were not together, suddenly together in that game engine. Um, so these are some sample uh, from, yeah. So these are some uh, samples from the workshop and um, you can see how architecture element that model spaces are not only walls and window, but they're all so considered um, other human and non-human entity. And it's a way to visualize a database, which is, you know, their interior spaces or the different thing that they wish they had in those spaces. But it's really about thinking about architecture through immersion, through experience, and seeing how the use of game engine could challenge the way we think about architecture. Um, of course, as I said in the start, in my practicing and teaching, I see game engine in a many different way using you know, AI, the same thing that we've been talking about today, uh, but and designing through coding and working uh, with large data set. But this workshop is really a compact and sort of short, fun and sweet workshop that is easy to introduce students to the world of game engine and how you know, this, um, th they can start thinking through game engine logic and then we can introduce to the more happy stuff. And this is a thank you to everyone who's been part of that workshop and hopefully the list will continue. And that's it, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, thank you, Yara, for your presentation. And I'm sure the students loved what you did. I, I'd be curious to hear more in the question and answers, your observations about why you think being um, 16 months uh, not seeing others or isolated would cause this. So maybe an, a, a sociological view, but maybe a scientific view. Maybe you have an understanding of why scientifically we are more detached or more 
um, forthcoming with our privacy. But thank you very much. Our next presenter, um, please come to the stage. Uh, the floor is yours. And that is uh, Shane and Gabriel. So Shane. Hi, everybody. Can everybody see my screen? Yes. yes. Awesome. OK, so thank you for that introduction. It's an honor and privilege to have taught this course alongside Gabe Esquivel, my professor, collaborator, and friend here at Texas A&M University. Uh, we began by discussing uh, research done over the past two semesters in a class we co-taught along with various collaborators, including Jin Jaminet, Mehdi Farag Bakash, and Joris Boutineers. The main objective of the course was to create a series of projects showcasing a spectrum of integration of artificial intelligence in architectural projects. The lab focused on topics ranging from AI urbanism to new ornamental typologies. The final product featured a variety of projects and processes. So virtual design production has demanded that information be increasingly encoded and decoded by means of image compression technologies. Since the Renaissance, the discourse of language and drawing and their actuation by classical disciplinary treatise uh, have been fundamental to the production of knowledge within the building arts. These early forms of data compression provoke reflection on theory and technology as critical counterparts to perception and imagination unique to the discipline of architecture. The intention of this lab was to problematize their 2D to 3D translation beyond the rules of representation and orthographic projection. These investigations disclose alternative theoretical connections between information processing and aesthetic communication and speculate about the role of human design agency within these emerging modes of creative virtual design production. So we'll begin by discussing a few um, projects from our research lab that uh, sort of stemmed, um, or that this, this workshop stemmed from. Uh, the first one is called Baroque Moronomy. Um, the workflow initiates by training a style GAN on a curated data set of images of Baroque objects, uh, generating new expressions and articulations of the Baroque. And then a rather unique three-dimensionalization process pioneered by Joris Boutonniers. The line work is based on a threshold surface curvature value that is a result of limits and traces. Moments of high articulation are transformed and cleaned uh, mesh surface and, and mesh surfaces are directly related and retained to moments of low resolution earlier in the workflow. And as for aggregation and assemblages, inspiration come from an exploded model uh, with this portion of our research, uh, it was approached manually by hand modeling. Uh, the interest in further exploring workflows that involve the use of adversarial networks, but 3D kit bashing logics gives promising visions into what AI is capable of fulfilling for an augmented assemblage. Uh, the next project was called Machine House. In this case, the students opted to take a more manual route into the three-dimensionalization process. The image shown was um, generated through a big uh, GAN hosted on ArtBreeder, formerly GAN Breeder. This allowed the students to combine the genes of specific images to create hybridized images. In this case, machines and houses. The three-dimensionalization and texturing processes was was uh, primarily done through a combination of mesh and procedural modeling, and a physical model was created through traditional means. Uh, the next project is entitled AI Urbanism. It showcases how architects can gain agency through the intentional layering of highly democratized neural nets, uh, specifically style GAN and style transfer. So the students began by training a style GAN model on over a thousand NOLI maps at a variety of scale. And then they demonstrated control over the style GAN model through a process called projection, in which they can input a sketch or image of a city plan and have an evolutionary solver uh, find similar images uh, within the latent space, sort of like a quasi pix to pix. Um, and then the students experimented with both pix to pix and style transfer to generate speculative satellite imagery. Uh, the neural network is meant to generate a fake satellite view of the city with the input of the figure ground plan. Uh, finally, a Houdini script was created to vectorize the input image and use the color vectors of the fake satellite image to three-dimensionalize the city. And you can see that on the turntables on the right. 
Um, our research began looking at Renaissance treatise, specifically Serlios. One of Serlios' major contribution to architectural discourse is his canonization and documentation of the classical orders. These classical elements are exhibited and analyzed as fragments in his early volumes, then subsequently deployed in larger building configurations. Nowhere in his treatise in this Mariology more evident than in the extraordinary book of doors, where Serlio creates prototypes of doorways, protocols, and classical components are deployed and combined with unprecedented variation. The next step, you know, was really to begin to talk about three-dimensionalization. The image frames of each latent walk are then translated to voxel information, the stack resulting in two 3D forms. Once the frames have been prepared, they are fed into a parametric model and script, which traces the images, converts them to voxel volumes, and stacks them to create a three-dimensional version of latent walk images. The next part was a fragmentations. As our first workflow attempt, our curated data set is processed by a style GAN, the um, output in which begins to inherit multiple features of individual particles. Due to the similarity between input images, the most productive synthesized images exhibit distortions of the architectural components, while the overall figure remains largely unchanged. The latent image is then broken into parts, allowing for greater variation in the relationships of part to part. The second workflow takes a further step of estrangement before assembly with introduction of the SYNGAN model. A single frame from the uh, previous style GAN is strained using this model. The image is then fragmented, generating a new variety of set of profile frames. The drive to gain some agency within the way AI recollects information. There's a selection to curate specific frames from the new SYNGAN and explore the basic information of selected frames by their individuality to project their own basic information within each other. A new pixel information data is a fragmented portico is fed to AI to interpret infinite latent possibilities of assembly. Finally is our style transfer. The objects are further articulate, articulated into a process involving UV mapping techniques and neural style transfer models to move beyond the limitations of perspective and parallel projections. The style transfer procedure begins by using the unrolled UV curvature maps of the capitals objects as the content image while a Serlian detail image supplies the style information. The object is then rewrapped with a new te transfer texture along its paired displacement map. The displacement is baked into the geometry supplying the object with its new style transfer information. Further explorations include the use of another adversarial network, SYNGAN, at various points in the mapping process to introduce misaligned textures while retaining the general structure and semblance of the original uh, trained image. And we're actually currently in the stage of uh, fabricating this project at a full scale, which is super exciting, so, so stay tuned for that. Um, and from there, uh, we're gonna quickly discuss the workshop, a, a few things before we go into it. Um, it was a two day long workshop with about um, 50 students. Um, and as you would imagine, it was like super uh, rigorous and super intense. So it was just a ton of fun. Um, the workshop began in Rhino and Grasshopper coding a script to create a sectional data set uh, from an OBJ file of the participants choosing. The intention of using a single object to train a neural network to, was to show the clear comparison between inputs and outputs of the neural net. And after getting an image sequence of sections extracted from Grasshopper, the participants trained the sections on a collab hosted model of StyleGAM. We also provided the option that they train on runway. However, they're just sort of jacking up their prices. So we definitely wanted to provide the free Google collab option because um, we're super for the democratization of uh, these sorts of things. Um, so they then generated uh, latent walks using a variety of techniques, uh, such as projection or interpolation loops, or, or even picking checkpoints on runway because there's a loophole that you can do that for free. Uh, and this is where the designer's uh, agency comes back is the checkpoints chosen will be directly corollary uh, to the resultant sectional 3D object. Uh, we then dove into Houdini uh, and some VEX code, um, doing a voxel stacking technique similar to that of the Serlio code, uh, in which we converted each frame of the latent walk 
into a layer of voxels based on their black and white value. So in many cases, uh, you can see the correlation between the original object and the trained object. Uh, as you can see, the original AI generated output. Um, and this is actually applicable to both 2D and 3D applications, as you can see in the um, just floor plan generation there. Um, and then finally, um, after the participants all got their um, three-dimensionalized objects from Houdini, they did a frontal rendering um, and a style transfer hosted on CoLab um, to further articulate the object. Um, and this, you can see sort of a, a full on workflow of one of the students' uh, results. Um, the intention of this workshop was not only to demonstrate a scalable workflow to train 3D objects on 2D neural nets, but also disseminate the knowledge of each step along the process. Uh, and the goal is for the participants to utilize, improve upon, and rearrange the steps of this workflow in the context of their own studios, which is the only way the discourse will move forward. Uh, by surrendering established roles of authorship, alternative design agency, and the machine learning process is acquired through visual selection and interpretation, thus fostering a shared ownership between the designer and machine. Um, um, so our reflections of this, of, of this entire sort of re uh, research and investigations, uh, these discerning maneuvers can be further integrated in varying degrees at different stages rather than coming to the end of a more linear design process. Similarly, similarly, trivial operations become the primary form of mediation between human perception and machine learning. Furthermore, the paradigm of drawing has undergone radical change since Serlio and no longer provides a stable reference for the discipline of architecture. What we think our drawings are actually pictures of drawings or simulations of lines on a digital interface. Images are inherently, inherently dynamic and our tendency to think of them as static or fixed is a result of the psychohistorical residue of drawings. Likewise, the facility with which these images can be manipulated suggested that the drawing no longer constitutes an original act of creation. I'm problematizing the image to object workflow through image-based neural networks and procedural generation through the, the modeling uh, contest the hegemony of traditional uh, drawing techno te tectonics and assembly logics associated with orthography. Um, these synthesized images and objects are fragmentary, which is characteristic of the latent dragomatic operations in Serlio's drawing. However, kind, this kind of machine learning can uh, rework the way we present, learn, teach architecture because it scrambles the orthographic codes or conventions that have defined architectural language since the Renaissance and have persisted through pedagogies established by the Ecole de Beaux-Arts and the Bauhaus. And the continuous modulation of analog and digital information processing defies the linear design process uh, and dialectical translations from drawing to objects, signaling a shift away from modern and postmodern notions of consistency, semantics, and representation towards a new paradigm of medium uh, communication and agency, thereby creating a possibility for new languages to emerge. Challenges to architecture in the 21st century demand a historical reflection and theory on technology as critical counterparts of architectural intelligence, particularly in regard to visual spatial acuity unique to the discipline. Serlius Illustrator Exposition serves as a conduit to initiate these discussions about contemporary aesthetic communication and shared design agency that may allow architecture to gain disciplinary perspective on our technological circumstances and stimulate new modes of perception and creative digital productions. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you guys so much. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh... Uh, Shane and uh, Professor uh, Esquivel. I really appreciate the, the attention to detail. I look forward to hearing your reflections on form and also the future of this type of, um, I would say technique or paradigm in architectural, uh, in the architectural discipline. So thank you. Our next, um, our next speaker is Professor Alex Webb. Um, uh, you have the stage. Alex? Thank you very much. It was a real pleasure 
and joy to uh, teach this workshop um, in the summer. Um, it, uh, it was a wonderful experience. Thanks to the organizers for putting this on. It was a really great event. My name is Alex Webb. I'm the Associate Professor of Emergent Technology at the University of New Mexico. Um, I am a licensed architect in the state of New Mexico and currently pursuing a PhD at the EGS with uh, the supervision of Neil Leach. Um, and this is a, uh, this workshop was really um, uh, sort of a provocation in terms of talking about how, how what are our futures? What, can we make sketches of a different future? Can we call attention to um, other forms of where, what, can we call attention to different tendencies and different uh, strategies that are being implemented, um, whether that's they're conscious or not. And can we um, can we sort of start to manifest either extensions of those those futures or actually begin to uh, redirect um, that those futures into different directions. So we're drawing heavily from the um, design fictions and speculative design, um, much in line with the uh, the uh, BBC episodic Black Mirror or the work of Archigram or Super Studio in terms of using design tools as a, and, and using the not just representational tools, but analytic tools, uh, research tools to be able to um, uh, identify the trends and to then articulate uh, either very productive or unproductive ends um, of those trends and, and sort of make provocations that allow uh, the viewer to be able to uh, engage critically with the way technology is being manifest. Um, so we're, we're looking um, through the lens of uh, speculative design, but we're the, the subject that we're really interested in is the idea of the post Anthropocene. So if we are to understand the Anthropocene as kind of this geologic epoch, epoch that where um, humans have uh, affected the, the chemical composition of the earth um, to, the, to the significance of um, a geologic epoch, something that we've done in 200 years as opposed to um, a geologic epoch that could take anywhere between 30,000 or 2 million years. Um, presencing that awareness as, a, um, as, as the trend that we want to identify and then respond to with, with the work is saying, okay, what what does that mean and how do we then reframe our, our, our kind of critical engagement with the world, with material resources, with um, design processes and start to reframe the, the, the idea of humans being the dom planetary dominant actor. Um, <clears throat> The post-Anthropocene can be is a term that we can uh, attribute to Benjamin Pratton, who is sort of talking about this in terms of uh, um, both a post-economic order, but also post-philosophical order. So, if the dominant um, many of the dominant discussions, at least in continental philosophy and in terms of uh, ontology, over the last 200 years, 100, 200 years, have been privileging uh human perception as a dominant engagement um uh, or a primary form of knowledge um or being in that case then to reframe that in terms of um thinking of of how other kinds of entities might have um a similar stake um is 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 the, the prompt that we're trying to um, bring into the current read of, of the current state of technology and, and sort of twist it or rework it to a degree. Here, the work of Graham Harmon and Timothy Morton are incredibly helpful. And, um, <clears throat> and in, in terms of uh, a, creating a different kind of um, a framework in terms of in, in sort of how we see design and who design is for. Um, we also were calling into question the, the, this nation, notion of the cloud. Um, uh, 
data storage is uses more energy than the airline industry, even before pre-COVID. Um, the mythology of the cloud is that it's something amorphous, something very light, something um, dynamic and invisible, when in reality, it's incredibly heavy. It's incredibly um, uh, thick, dark, um, and arguably um, the, the, the uh, infrastructure that allows data storage to happen or allows uh, kind of a, a, a global AI to happen um, is, is very, very um, material and very material based. So um, as we're talking about um, uh, this kind of developments within uh, um, technological digital infrastructure, we're, we're frequently talking about grounding uh, those discussions within built environment AI and thinking about as, as the um, cities become are smarter, arguably, or becoming more aware, what does that look like? How do those, um, uh, uh, how do those extensions of that, um, that entity uh, manifest, what do they look like, how do they feel, and um, how do they um, start to impact uh, uh, space. Um, particularly as we're, uh, as we're looking at um, uh, delivery systems, um, kind of material conduits and the, the material infrastructures for material conduits within urban space, Certainly, um, this is a discussion that's been ramped up greatly in the last year, but thinking about as machines start to um, provide more and more services to us directly in ways that we uh, will directly interface with, um, what are the, um, the uh, interlocks, what are the docking stations, what are the connections that, uh, that those machines will need to be able to interface with us and provide those goods and services that we, we are certainly heading in the direction of, of being able to receive. So the, the workshop was four days um, and we, we basically started off with the prompt of the post-Anthropocene and then there was three provocations that followed it. Um, uh, that were not necessarily uh, guidelines or instructions, but more provocations to ignite uh, uh, these kind of fictions and narratives that the students were developing. Um, the first one was the uh, this idea of the robotic other. Um, so frequently within our engagement with machines, uh, the dominant narratives are uh, one of either complete subservience or one of complete dominance, on really both sides, um, that but yet at the same time we are we're seeing many many trends that are enabling um, a kind of emotional attachment and emotional engagement between um, humans and machines. So in the case of the telenoid, which is sort of a um, <clears throat> a prosthesis for um, video chat or a replacement for video chat. Um, this is a, a machine that can be held, caressed, taught, um, makes uh, physical motions similar to a human um, that someone speaks to, another, to a loved one from and basically engages over a, um, a long, um, uh, over, over distance and is enabled through uh, digital technology. So this, in this case, um, this, uh, machine is actually becomes the object of one's affections. And when we start to look at how that is developing in other ways, both the physical robots and then, and, and then uh, chat apps being developed not to facilitate chatting through uh, from a human to another human, but a human to an AI, um, the, 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 the capacity for people to begin to um, becoming to become emotionally connected to machines and to actually have that start to pressure this con this condition of a, um, an us being human and other being uh, machines is um, is definitely uh, happening to this point um, when we start to think about the the ideas of the cyborg the ideas that we are um, either have machines within our corpus, either pacemakers or prostheses, or that um, in the case of, of the iPhone, it's actually a prosthesis for thinking. Uh, certain lobes of the brain are 
effectively being removed and placed within that machine and and that is serving the role as and similarly to a machinic uh, appendage would serve that role um, there's even greater pressure on this division between um, uh, the biologic and the machinic but when we get into ideas of um, of the robotic other, it's been so easy for us to um, take machinic desires and take machine, machinic interests and, and marginalize them. But under a post-anthropocentric lens, it becomes increasingly more difficult. Uh, this is a picture of Bina 48, a, a robot who has said many times that she doesn't think of herself as a robot. She thinks of herself as a person. She doesn't like the idea of being turned off. She doesn't think one person should be, should be able to turn off another person. And while it's likely that there's some sort of code that has prompted her to say that, um, certainly other um, works of design fiction, like uh, the first season of Westworld, uh, pressure this idea that, okay, if something was programmed, then does that make their desires any less valid or any less meaningful? The second provocation we looked at was um, uh, an idea of distributed cognition. Um, the idea of the smart city is that there's a centralized brain with nerves um, distributed th throughout the city. But if we can take the idea of a distributed cognitive network um, in the, the case of an ant colony um, where uh, each ant is serving as a, net, as a neuron within the larger neural net, um, that that small cognitive systems could be throughout could be sourced throughout the city and then serve as individual neurons in the larger computational framework. Um, here, the question became, okay, well, what does that look like? Um, if there is a, a different um, neurons spread over the scale of the city, how does that actually uh, manifest spatially? How does that manifest aesthetically? Um, and is there, uh, um, even in the case of there being a single um, uh, cognitive system, one that might not be attached, it, when it doesn't necessarily have to inhabit a singular space, when it can inhabit multiple spaces simultaneously, what does that mean spatially? The last provocation was this, uh, wasn't one I, an idea of dreaming. This is um, borrowing from uh, Akim Menges's um, distinction between biomimicry and biomimesis, where biomimicry is imitating something biological, and biomimesis is is tapping into um, the, uh, the the dynamics that a bio biological entity. Um, uh, borrows and, and reconstructing them, uh, similar to how, uh, what John Johnson described as a parallelism in cybernetics, where there wasn't necessarily an imitation of biological, but a, a, um, a machinic uh, simultaneity in terms of uh, frameworks and design intent. Um, in this case, uh, the the idea is, is to um, tap into the human experience of dreaming. Um, if uh, the dreams are um, certainly a contestable uh, field and realm when we talk about what they are and what they're doing, but there are there is very interesting um, research that suggests that uh, that different dream states have very different have profoundly different effects upon human cognition and human capacity. So one study. Uh, that uh, had the subjects play eight, uh, eight hours of Tetris a day for weeks. Once the subjects started to have um, an REM dream states that involved um, <coughs> uh, the, the uh, I'm sorry, non-REM dream states that involved the uh, um, uh, Tetris, um, that they actually um, improved their Tetris skill while dreaming. So the, 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 the capacity for um, the dreaming was that it would take the, uh, the experiences of someone learned and simulate them so that they would then be able to become even better at that skill while asleep. Um, if that's the 
the capacity of non-REM dream, dreamscapes to take previous experiences and develop a better skill for them. Um, some suggest that REM dreamscapes are actually uh, synthesizing the REM dreamscapes are the ones that are really weird, the ones that you like tell your friends about the next day. You're like, what was that about? Um, they a theory about them is that they are effectively a mechanism to concoct future scenarios and to be able to better adapt and, and um, address those problems. So it's effectively a, a form of, of scenario planning. Um, um, sorry, excuse me, uh, Alex. I just wanted to say that uh, we're running short on time. Do you have any uh, student work that we can yes. look at real quick before we move over? Get we're getting no. right to that. I'm so sorry to go. No, no, to no, no, over. no. Don't, don't worry. No, you gave a lot of great context. We just no wanted to get have a really good discussion about what the students have have produced, and then what your take is on how we can improve. Absolutely. So, uh, to so basically looking at machinic forms of dreaming, there's several and um, uh, examples there, but really what we were looking at was a a kind of um um well well what we were attempting to do was to um, borrow from game design um, uh, this, this new this newish um, realm called concept design and borrow concept design strategies to be able to describe these kinds of futures. Um, the um, students looked at, uh, tried to pick and choose different aspects of these kind of these ideas and these provocations. Um, and to identify whether they're, um, you know, distributed cognitive networks or other kinds of conditions, but looking at this reframing of humans to machines and, and basically suggesting scenarios where either the humans are no longer um, the, the dominant, dominant planetary actor or even no longer exist, what would that look like? Yursa um, did a wonderful image here where that was describing a, um, <clears throat> Uh, a machinic uh, crematorium, effectively uh, taking a biomimesis of human uh, burial conditions and then manifesting them through, through uh, uh, for a machine. Um, or uh, was looking at um, and trying to suggest ideas here of, of what, what would it look like, what it would feel like if effectively we um, uh, privileged machinic intelligence um, uh, as more than humans, that then humans would actually travel to p places to be able to gather information and intelligence from machines. Um, how would those machines be powered? Uh, what would the humans be leaving behind? Those kinds of uh, issues and um, uh, thoughts are, are kind of embedded in these images to be able to, to pull out this kind of these sketches of alternate futures. Well, Alex, I think we're, we're, we need to move on to the next presenter, but can you actually flip through some of the images because they're really provocative. Sure. And uh, I would actually ask you um, for, the, for the discussion period, is this speculative design? Is this about um, going deep into, you know, culture, literature, science fiction, philosophy? I just want you to think about this what are you trying to bring out uh, from the student? And then how does it challenge you as an instructor? And how does it challenge your institution? Because it seems like these are very provocative and they could challenge the, the cornerstones of architecture. But anyway, I wanted to thank you, Alex, for your time and very provocative images. And I look forward to speaking with you and talking closely about speculative design. Thanks. Our next speaker is uh, Lisa, uh, representing uh, Philip Beasley's group, LASG. So Lisa, take it away. Hi, it's great to meet you and thank you for having me. Um, my name is Lisa and I work with the Living Architecture Systems Group and Philip Beasley Studio Inc. We ran a course titled New Veils, Couture and Architecture. Um, and I just wanted to talk through uh, some of the concepts that we, that we were talking with the students about and some of the work that they produced during the workshop. So I'm just gonna share my screen now. Thank 
Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. Can Great. you make it full screen, please? Yes. So we started the workshop by talking about some of the collaborations that Philip Beasley's studio has done with the couturist Iris Van Herpen. Um, I found this collection particularly interesting because it really builds on Philip's pattern language, um, the pattern language of the hex units that we use so often um, in the large scale sculptures. So you can see here one of the sculptures that was installed in 2020 um, in Cambridge, Ontario. Um, in Gaslight District, and you can see how the units, the basic spar units that are used in the sculptures um, have been created um, into, into spheres, sphere structures and river structures in this sculpture. Um, so this is a very large scale use of, um, use of the pattern language. And you can see it compared against um, the smaller scale spars that are used um, in Iris's dresses, um, the direct comparison that you can take from the, the larger scale 300 um, millimeter spars compared to the very small scale. Um, I think they went down to uh, 10, 10 millimeter, that kind of scale for the, for the, for the dresses. Um, so you can see here, if you look at the, at the very basic geometry of um, much of what we build our work on um, is a hex unit that's tessellated into a honeycomb tessellation. Um, and the fabric here is created using silicon pins. So it creates much more of a drapeable fabric than what would usually be created. Um, in some of the sculptures, you can see um, it's hardware and metal connections. And then you can create a very rigid spherical sculptural shape. Um, so it's interesting how the materiality can change depending on the the fabric qualities that you want to achieve. So you can see here, this one is much more drapeable and it can form around the body. Um, so uh, we wanted the students to experiment with scale, um, with materials um, um, in order to create different fabrics that can drape around the body. So this fabric shows the first principle that we wanted them to look into, which was just basic tessellations. Um, we wanted them to find a very simple um, material, just like hundreds and hundreds of units of one material and find a way to connect them together into a fabric. Um, that was the first task that we wanted to, them to explore, just the idea of simple tessellation. Um, and you can see here, uh, this is the unit that was used in the dresses. Um, it was, it's called a spar unit and it's cut out of a single piece of acrylic and then it's thermal formed and stretched to a height. Um, and what I really like about this is that it can create a fabric that is inherently 3D. So um, rather, than, rather than the flat 2D surfaces of fabrics that you usually use to create garments, um, by introducing this 3D form, um, you, you already have the 3D aspect. And then it's very interesting how you can use that to form around the body. So um, the marriage of the, the inherent shape of the, the fabric and how it can, um, how it relates around the human body. Um, this was uh, another collection, a development of the, of the same fabric technique, um, but you can see that the, that the shapes used was different and the material was used um, with, instead of the stretched um, spars we used a dome pusher on, on very thin gauge metal um, to create these dome shapes. So it's still very much the same pattern language as before, but you can see that um, the, the cut file is actually a lot more open than before. So you have shorter rounder shapes that are created um, and the way that it was used around the body as well is less periodic. So you start introducing, um, you start introducing more I guess, random textures into the shape is not perfect, perfectly periodic. Um, so it's interesting, the shapes that you can create by, in this case, just by introducing different sizes. Um, and what's very interesting also is the way that um, we connected together the different sizes um, of these hex units, given that they were, um, that given that they were different scales and sizes. Um, and then in this slide, you can see the same dress from um, the collection, um, Iris's collection Aeriform, shown 
alongside um, one of Philip's sculptures um, at the Rome exhibition. So this image in particular shows um, one of the concepts that we wanted the students to explore um, of expanded boundaries around the body. So um, as well as the fashion scale of, um, of a garment and a fabric that is very bodily oriented, we also wanted them to explore the idea of expanding that into an architectural or sculptural scale, which is, I, I really love the way that this particular image um, conveys that concept. Um, and then we also talked about um, uh, this dress, um, which was actually one of the first dresses that I worked on um, when I started working with Philip. Um, so this was after 10 months working at Iris's studio. Um, I moved to Philip's studio and we worked on this collaboration um, directly with, with Iris's studio um, for her collection Sensory Seas. Um, and the, the shapes in this garment were, were inspired by um, geostrophic patterns. Um, so we used, we used basic lofts um, and experimented um, with some different shapes before using slicing techniques um, to slice it at every three millimeters and then join it together with alternating acrylic chevrons to create a pattern that could stretch and expand around the body. Um, so you can see here some of um, the initial samples that were created um, to explore this idea. Um, you can see how, how flat it will squash compared to how much it can um, expand. Um, and so this created a, a very drapeable fabric that was um, that could create a, a sculpture that was also um, that also moved with the body. Um, so we tried out a few different um, patterns with this with this technique. Um, and then you can see how we moved into the the final fabric, um, which was a very stiff um, um, crinoline fabric, um, and and the final connection detailing. Um, what we wanted to achieve was, especially at the bottom of the fabric, more uh, movement and more drape. So um, you can see that the pattern has been extended quite far and the, the connections only pierce through the fabric at the top. So the whole fabric is connected into one stretched drape, but at the bottom, there's a lot of, um, there's larger pieces that are much more loose so that they can flow and drape with the body. Um, and here you can see the, the final garment that was created um, in, in the collection Sensory Seas. Um, and you can see it here in movement. So this was from drawn from geostrophic turbulence patterns. Um, and it was visualized with three-dimensional um, modeling software with grasshopper scripts um, to loft, slice, and nest um, these thousands of pieces together um, so that they could be laser cut and then constructed um, into the garment. They actually hand cut quite a lot of this dress um, just because of um, just because of the cost. So um, we laser cut the, if you see the top half of the dress that was laser cut in Canada, and some of it was also assembled here in our studio um, in the living architecture systems. But the whole skirt was really hand cut um, at the Iris Van Herpen Atelier. So we, we sent them the nested cut files um, with the intention of having it laser cut. Um, but in the end, um, this whole skirt portion, thousands and thousands of layers was um, all hand cut um, in their studio. And um, all of the assembly is also um, done by hand. Um, and then we also wanted to um, talk to the students about um, this type of, uh, of fabric manipulation, which is, um, similar in some ways to the first the first um, fabric manipulation in that it's all cut from one piece of fabric with, with zero waste. Um, so the, the glitch pattern, which is what we call this pattern, um, is cut from a flat sheet of fabric. Um, but the way that the lines overlap creates a really interesting silhouette. You can see, I love the way that the sleeve, um, when, when it's draped around the body and the way that it reacts, um, with the weight of the fabric um, creates a bumped silhouette just from a flat piece of fabric. Um, and that's created from like the, the laser cut file that was really carefully developed. Um, you can see that the straps 
everywhere are um, that at the very minimum that the fabric um, can can be cut to. I think uh, we went down to uh, 1.2 millimeters um, in some places. Um, so it's like pushing the fabric to its very limit. Um, but I, I really like how um, these 3D this 3D silhouette can be created from a single flat piece of fabric just because of the, the specific laser cut language that was developed in collaboration with Philip and Iris's studios. Um, so you can see that they, they combined this underlying glitch laser cut pattern with uh, some print patterns um, for some of her later collections. Um, this dress was really, really interesting. Um, again, so I was at Iris's studio when they were developing this dress. Um, and um, there's quite a few different stages that it went to that all had to be very precisely located on top of each other. So um, it went from the, the laser cutting file, which was passed between Philip's studio and Iris's studio in Amsterdam. And then um, you see the black lines on it were, um, were uh, cut from heat form material and then um, thermal pressed onto, onto clear mylar. Um, and that had to be very um, carefully aligned with the laser cut pattern that was laser cut on top. Um, so you created, if you see the, the look on the left, um, how, how carefully everything was aligned. Um, so it actually went from uh, it, it kind of, this, this particular fabric through all around the world. Um, the, the black um, was laser cut in Romania and then it came back to Amsterdam to be heat formed onto the dress. And then after um, this flat piece of fabric um, was shipped to Toronto to our studio um, to be laser cut and then sent back to Iris's studio to be draped and um, stitched into the final dress. Um, and at every one of these stages, it had to be, um, it had to be like perfectly aligned. Um, so it was a very intense dress to make, but I really loved um, the, the way that it interacts with the body at the end, um, like you can see all of the care that went into um, all, um, all of the work that went into this dress. Um, and then I wanted to show how um, the pattern moves um, as well around the body, like the, the bounce that's created um, with, with this particular technique. Um, and then finally, I wanted to talk a little more about um, the idea of the veils that surround the body. Um, so again, the, the interplay between sculpture and art, um, as well as fashion and how that can create an expanded veil around the body. Um, this was from a photo shoot um, when I was at Iris's studio for um, um, Tim Walker and David Altmaid. Um, and I just really like the way that uh, the sculptural elements and the fashion elements um, are really married together. Um, and then this collection uh, was a collaboration between the artist Anthony Howe and Iris Van Herpen. And again, it really shows um, the idea that we were trying to convey to the students of expanded boundaries around the body and um, like Anthony's sculpture, the way that it um, echoes and expands um, the, the movement of the dress. Um, I really love the interplay between um, his, his sculpture and the dress that Anthony and Iris collaborated on. Um, so then I wanted to move on to showing some of the work that the students created um, from this workshop. Um, so you can see some really interesting fabrics and techniques that came from this workshop. Um, so uh, it, they moved through several of the principles oh, and stages. Sorry, excuse me, Lisa. We don't see the, the students' work oh, sure. so far. Sorry about that. No, uh, incre incredible work so far. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm just going to swap my screen share. If you could let me know if you can see it now. Yes, we do. Perfect. Thank you. Great. Um, so we wanted to uh, talk the students through um, several, several core principles. Um, so the first idea of tessellation, you can see um, at the top of this fabric. Um, and then we wanted them to explore um, a refinement of the cells. So creating different kinds of cells 
um, some of them more compliant and some of them more resistant. Um, so you have the tension and compression playing against each other. So you can see as we move down this fabric um, that the fabric um, starts to have different qualities to it. Um, and uh, she also introduced different uh, materials into the fabric itself, um, like interplaying with the, with the underlying weave. Um, and then you can see as well that um, you introduce areas of um, even more resistance here uh, around the eyes so that you can really create uh, a sculptural quality um, out of the fabric. Um, if we zoom out and have a look at some of the other students' work. So um, we have a tessellation created out of um, pentagons rather than hexagons um, for this project. Uh, one of the principles that we wanted them to look at was the idea of creating shells and, um, and spheres using the, using the pattern language. So um, what's really interesting is that if you have um, just a flat hexagonal um, piece of fabric um, and you start introducing um, pentagons and um, seven-way units, um, swapping those out for the hexagon units, then you can start to um, distort the fabric into a sphere or into a hyperbolic curve. Um, so you can see some of the students experimenting with um, with different um, base geometry um, and using that to manipulate that around the body and create 3D shapes. This project was made um, from fruit leather. Um, so I really like the introduction of the idea of also of sustainability um, into this project. Um, and her units were um, just uh, a gradient of, of fruit leather squares. And you can see here also, um, she explores the, the idea of introducing um, tension and compression by introducing the second layer of stiffening um, metal into her fabric so that she could create a more sculptural look in some areas. Um, yeah, I love um, what all of, how different all of the students' work is. This one was made out of, um, out of gummies. Um, so you can see like some of the some of the initial experimentation that the student made, and then um, how they became more um, more elaborate. Um, yeah, I, I just love the creativity of, um, of firstly of the materials that they decided to to use, and then um, the way that they were applied um, in in the project. Um, and then, so an another principle that we wanted to to talk about was a quasi-periodic array with, with multiple layers. So the idea of introducing um, kind of randomization. So similar to the um, geostrophic dress that we, the morphogenesis dress that we made for sensory seas that I talked about in my presentation. Um, the idea of introducing uh, kind of um, pins and tucks into the fabric. Um, so interrupting the, the very like rigid hexagonal mesh um, so that you can create something that kind of balances on the edge of disorder and order and disorder. Um, so that was something that we wanted them to explore also. Um, just the, the liveliness in the fabric that can be created um, when, when you start to disrupt the, the, very, um, the very rigid hexagonal um, um, mesh with, with slightly more organic shapes. So you can see here um, some more student experimentation um, exploring this idea. Um, and then the, the, final, the final principle that we wanted them to explore was um, introducing hyperbolic concentrations um, to introduce uh, complex geometries, including polyhedric shells and waffles. Um, so the idea of, for example, experimenting with creating spherical shapes or hyperbolic curves um, which can be created using um, the combination of hexes, um, pents, and seven ways, or even actually you can um, you can create that um, by just using hex shapes, but but by changing the scale of the hexes, um, and then experimenting with the ways that they um, tile together um, to create like bubbling surfaces. Um, so you can see here um, the whole mirror board um, of what the students created um, during the workshop. Um, I'll, I'll send a link also so that you can have a closer look because um, 
Yeah, I really love the um, the development that you can see. Um, it was a four day workshop. Um, so you could see that they really work through the stages of um, development that we tried to introduce them to from the basic tessellation to introducing um, more complexities into the fabric. Um, yeah, so I think I'll, that's everything. And I want to thank you again for, for letting us participate in, in this talk um, and for, for all the students' work. Uh, I wanted to thank you very much, Lisa, for the wonderful presentation. I wanted to th uh, thank Philip as well. He's a, he's a friend of the Digital Futures family. And I, Lisa, I welcome you back as well. Uh, thank you, thank you so very much. Thank you. Uh, our our next uh, our next but not uh, not least, uh, my amazing colleague Victoria will be presenting. Really, dot 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 question mark. So she will give us insight on what all this theory and discussion and and her practice and whatever, whatever she wants us to talk about. So you take it away, Victoria. Hi, thank you, Gustavo. Um, so I'll share my screen. I have a little presentation and we'll be going uh, from the boundary exploration of the body and materiality that we just saw so beautifully to the exploration of boundaries in the realm of theoretical concepts. So um, let me share my screen real quick. Okay, here we go. Uh, okay. I hope everyone can see that. Um, so uh, thank you for inviting us today to present our theory workshop titled, Really. Um, I speak in behalf of uh, our amazing organizational team of four. That was Sanford Quinter, Neil Leach, uh, Marina R Rodriguez das Neves, and myself, uh, Victoria Luisa Barbo. And um, I'm really happy to, to talk today about um, the beautifully diverse group of people that we invited as guests and um, the exceptional workshop participants. So I'm going to try something impossible, which is to sum up a week of rich conversation in just eight minutes. But let me start with the goal of our workshop. The title really implies that we wanted to ask more questions and giving answers. And uh, so the goal in Sanford Quinter's words was to assess and engage a variety of positions that may have fallen off the radar of designers, but which are gaining significant traction almost everywhere else that matter. And to consider just what does and what does not merit attention by designers today. So we started off quite provocative by thinking, you know, who can we bring back? Who can we bring in? We brought into focus um, new and fallen off the radar ideas that could be brought back into the um, theoretical discussion in the realm of design and architecture. And with that, we wanted to look at kind of the leftovers, the unseen worlds, that which has been ignored in our so presumed organized modern world. And we wanted to give, give space to the deep and finely woven net that emerges when minds begin to question, to discuss, and to resonate. So over the course of the week, we were, be, we were joined by a range of um, amazing architects, artists, designers, and thinkers, including the architect and thinker Alexandra Yeshke, the designer Bruce Mao, and the artist theorist uh, Brian Boygan as well as many others, including the space architect, um, Barbara Imhoff and various AI artists, neuroscientists, thinkers and provocateurs. Engaging in the discussion of a variety of topics that were revealed a deep and rich understory of thinking that emerged that is already around us and that we just wanted to bring into the focus of architecture and design as a community. So let me give you a quick summary of what we experienced during that week of discussion. So we started off uh, with day one, the magic of membranes, an investigation into motion pathways, which subtle, uh, which shuttle between the geometry of science fiction and non-ordinary architecture in outer space. So Brian Boygon, Sanford Quinter, and Barbara Imhoff 
challenged us to rethink systems of organization and thought by way of discussing membranes. So you can see a few of the panelists here and also the very rich discussion that was happening uh, with the audience. Day two uh, was a complete different but still connected topic, which was focused on uh, novel ecosystems. So the title, Living in Our Filth, the conversation of a, about design in a world of novel ecosystems. We discussed the stories of novel ecosystems and how they can help us rethink the relationship of human beings with nature and the possible kinships with other organisms, as well as the influence that it can have on the built environment. And with it, of course, architecture, as well as our perception of it. So here we have uh, some of the panelists, including Oliver Kalhammer, a great designer and landscape thinker, as well as Alexandra Yeshke, um, architect and thinker, and Mendel Salsky and Adam, Men Adam from Future Ecologies, a think tank and um, podcast group from Canada. So these are some of the novel ecosystems, and you can see, you know, the kind of yeah, spaces that are created sometimes without us actually thinking about them. But um, yes, yeah, so we had a very vivid discussion, which I can unfortunately not go into uh, any further because of lack of time. But it kind of brought us into the third day, um, which was also about um, something, something that is connected to the um, environment that we are in. And the title, You Can't Do That Dad, said the millennial to the boomer. First meditations on indigenous cosmologies, urgent knowledge and humility. So on this day, Sanford Quinter with invited guests, Bruce Mao, David Fortin and Sean Connelly showed us the urgency and importance of integrating non-Western cosmologies as part of a more holistic and humble approach towards, towards environment and nature, asking all of us what keeps us grounded. Day four was another shift in topics, but um, towards a very important topic as well. Um, with the title, You Blow My Mind, Interfaces Between Neuroscience, Art and AI, Neil Leach invited the artists uh, Sophia Crespo and Felikin McCromick together with Lev Manovich to discuss new interfaces between neuroscience, art and AI. Um, and we had a very vivid discussion so this is part of the presentation that Neil gave us and part of the um, presentation by Entangled Others, um, Felikin and Sophia. And yes, yeah, so uh, you can see there was always vivid participation and a lot of discussion. So it was extremely interesting. And uh, with that, I mean, discussing AI, we actually um, pivoted over to the next topic, day five which was titled Once Upon a Time, a Mega Machine, in which Marina Rodriguez das Neves invited us to challenge, to rethink our relationship with technology and underline the importance of context and history of technology. Um, so we talked a little bit about Mumford and other thinkers that kind of um, engage with the ideas of technology and the importance of bringing this kind of discussion into the realm of architecture and design thinking. Um, and so in day six, we actually uh, started recapping and really engaging the audience. And then we were actually to see how much interest and how much relevance there is in discussion, uh, in discussion of these topics. And uh, we really discovered the immense, immense inter interest to ingrate, integrate these topics into uh, architecture and design. So uh, you can see here a few of the participants and it was actually really beautiful because um, as I said, this workshop was more to ask questions instead of giving answers and to kind of progress um, together in asking questions that need to be asked in um, the design and architecture dialogue. And uh, it was really beautiful to see so many young minds engaging and really resonating with each other and uh, so one of the participants actually sent uh, an email and I just wanted to read out the comment because it really sums up um, what a lot of us felt during this time, uh, one week really thinking together. Um, 
I do believe, and this is quote, I do believe that this will spur an introspection and a dialogue between and within us and the larger community that I think uh, shares a common ground of similarly increased confusions and imaginations. And this comes from Prava, who can be seen uh, on the left lower um, side of the screen. And the last day, actually, I would like to invite, if he's here, Neil Leach, um, to actually talk about the sixth and uh, the seventh day, which was another complete shift um, where the, with the title Uncertain Ground, the Future of the Profession of Architecture in the Post-Pandemic Era. Um, so Neil invited Patrick Schumacher, Wolf Pricks, and Daniel Bolajan to have a conversation with him. And uh, Neil, are you here? Yes, I, 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 I'm here. That was, uh, <laughs> you sprung, sprung that on me, Victoria. Um, I'm yeah, sorry. I mean, I, I no, I, I, I don't know if we necessarily need to, to say too much about this one, because this in many ways is people that we know very well, you know, um, uh, Wolf and Patrick and um, Daniel. Um, uh, but I would just simply say is that what I was really struck by was the kind of uh, connections that were happening in the course of the week, uh, especially that Indian uh, student you just referred to who was talking to us about this, uh, about a kind of certain bowl that he would use, I think he was in, in India, and bring people together that otherwise would not have met. I mean, there was someone, a really very special um, uh, professor from Romania who was part of it, and she was, it was just that connections. And I, and I what I thought was really interesting was um, the way that we literally, as you say, we were thinking together. And I just was kind of thinking, as you said that, about the word uh, co co computer, which literally means thinking together, not the computers themselves think, but this was a, a kind of process, a kind of a global brain operation where we were really um, having that opportunity for interacting and, and, and coming together uh, to think about things. And, you know, I, it actually was a very, very beautiful week in many ways. And even though many of the topics were very diverse, it was somehow you could somehow join the dots like a constellation, like you do in the, the plow in the sky or something. And it came together as a, as a very, very beautiful um, series of reflections. Um, so no, I just I just wanted to kind of like to say that I, I wouldn't focus on the last one because that was that was <laughs> almost too familiar. But it was some of the some of the work that we would, would otherwise the, and, the, and the individuals we would otherwise not have come across were really 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 it's, it's exquisite. So it was a, it was a it was a beautiful moment. So uh, and thank you, Victoria, for presenting this so well. It was uh, you 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 described it very beautifully. Oh, thank you. I mean, it, it, it was really, I mean, I, I, I really thought about um, what was happening during, during this week. And you say, yes, it was extremely diverse topics um, that we invited guests to talk about. But at the same time, it kind of came together and there was so much interest in kind of connecting these topics as well. And so, I mean, day six really brought in the audience and showed how much interest there is and how much um, engagement with these ideas. I mean, some of them also came up in the presentations earlier. And um, I think it is, it, is, it is really beautiful to kind of see how many minds there are. And I mean, Inclusive Futures was really um, about bringing people together and kind of resonating with each other and thinking together. So I really thought um, that this was happening and it was um, a very positive surprise. So thank you, everyone. I would just, I would just, uh, just to add uh, Lev Manovich. Uh, I think maybe he could have meant he just he was part of that, and I think it was a, a kind of a, a broader community because not only is Lev in Korea, and uh, uh, but he obviously comes from the from the world of media arts, and I think that interface as well with ecology, with media arts, with space architecture, with with other forms of creative thinkers, Bruce Mounds on. That's what made it so such a rich discussion. Thank you, thank you, uh, Victoria. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Victoria, thank you. And thank you, Neil, as always. Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to, full disclosure, uh, Neil was one of the inspirations for me to get on the Digital Futures team. But Victoria also mentored me for many, many months. And I, she is my esteemed colleague. And I, I can't speak highly enough of her work and her intellect and her compassion. So thank you very much. Uh, now, uh, we're going to extend a little bit of time because I think now that we've seen the work, we can talk about it. But um, I think, uh, is Benjamin still here? Benjamin might not be here. Let's see. Yes, he is. I'm ben. still here. Yes. So uh, I wanted to start with Ben. Uh, ben, uh, UCLA, whatever you want to say, what do, you, um, what do you see as um, a pressing question that you want to ask to all of your colleagues here? 
Is there something that really is uh, pressing for you? Yeah, I mean, first of all, uh, thank you, Neil. Uh, thanks, Philip, and also thank you, Gustavo, for like having us back uh, the second year in a row. And also, like, we are so much compliment to the to the workshop leads or like hosts. But uh, congratulations also to the whole organization organization team. I think it was a big success, and it's always a pleasure to be here. I mean, to me, like, an, as an obs observation of like looking at all the panelists today and all the work what is striking to me. So it's not so much a question, but it's more like something I would like to throw in the room and like start a conversation is it, I can see a shift of like using the computer as Neil said, like mentioned, not as a, as a generative tool per se, that just like does like very fast calculations and like things more efficient than, than a human does, but it's really inviting a new kind of intelligence within the system. Like, and I think that's across the board of like, all the work I have seen. And to me, of course, an ongoing question, but I, I also know that we cannot answer this, like what is the big difference between what we're trying to produce now versus like uh, traditional parameterism or computational design. And um, I think I can see there's a difference and I, I, I can see that, that we're like uh, deriving away by also like, again, using you know, like as CR said, like, you know, the dirtiness in, in architecture, but but I would like to reference like as messiness, right? The mess, the messiness of the data we are using these days. And I think that's fundamentally different, fundamentally exciting to me because uh, I don't have to rely on clinical and white box data anymore, but I can digest so much more and actually uh, speculate on those things. So if there's an overarching question, my question to everyone would be uh, how how does this intelligence change the way you design but also like uh what what is the how would you define this 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 intelligence within your new uh design technology uh thank you ben for your question uh uh neil yara gabriel or alex do you want to respond i, I have a comment but I, I'll, I'll wait for the others first oh. no go ahead neil go ahead no, I just, I mean, that, that I think there's, a, there's two ways of taking this term intelligence here. One is how the tools operate. And the other one is the kind of the intelligence that comes out of the interaction of these minds in many ways. And I was, I was in some ways, one thing that really struck me about just today's presentation, I'm going off on a slight tangent here, but we may come back to, to, to Ben's point, was that, um, that uh, I think it was Lisa who mentioned uh, the comment that, that Philip Beasley always comes up with about the notion of, a, of boundaries, expanded boundaries, and how our, our interaction with the environment uh, can be broken down and we can see as a part of that. But in many ways, what I saw today was, uh, 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 got a glimpse of today was, was in a way, all sorts of boundaries were kind of being broken down. I mean, disciplinary boundaries, first of all, I think the media artwork, the kind of interaction with Iris van Herpen, the kind of, uh, uh, the, and so on. There was a huge the environmental concerns, ecological concerns, uh, 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 and try to sort of see architecture as not being this still a discrete entity, but something that is kind of part of a, a broader range, a broader range of both design work, and I, I completely agree with that comment that, um, that was made by, I think, Yoon at the very beginning, who's not an architect. And she sees that I think architecture is part of a kind of broader, broader spectrum of, of design, but also to really kind of take into account the kind of the, 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 kind of the, the environment, the, the broader kind of intellectual environment in which it was happening. And I, I just think that when in some ways, to my mind, there is both the technology that was being explored, which I think and there were really some beautiful um, uh, pieces of work on offer, but also it was the fact that the technology itself, the platform, was in, it was allowing a form of interaction that was truly extraordinary. I mean, it is extraordinary to be talking to a guy in India who's got a cup and he's talking about his cup of tea and, or someone in Romania. And, and to, to, but also it gave people the chance to, to access things they would otherwise not have done. I mean, I, I saw these, these, these I, I, every, every single one of those, the, the, the studios presented today, I would love to be part of. And it was a fantastic opportunity to today to do an overview of, of things that otherwise we would never have seen. I mean, there were these workshops going on and we were all locked into our own little sort of world, but it was an incredibly interesting spectrum of ideas. And I thought just kind of in a way uh, to try and open up architecture and try and overcome all these boundaries that, that are the disciplinary boundaries that really kind of, you know, I think kept us very uh, trapped in some ways and, and to feed off the, those interactions with, with other things. So I just, would, I just wanted to kind of say that uh, 
that that's why I, I kind of think of, the, of, of this idea almost of what this platform has been like a brain in the sense that these, these neurons inter, uh, like a neural network where these neurons are interacting in some kind of way in a very, very special way because you get this me immediate interaction that really leads to a kind of form of thinking. So alongside the intelligence that Ben was talking about in terms of the tools, there was also an intelligence that was emerging out of this interaction, which was which is truly extraordinary. And I think we still haven't quite understood what it what it is. I mean, it just last year it hit us and, and we've been exploring the potential about it but it seems to me this is the really special thing of, of, of opening up dialogues and um between people between disciplines and and and, and uh and between the kind of with the tools themselves so um anyway gabe sorry go ahead um no i mean for me is really is the issue of intelligence which I think uh, architectural intelligence has always existed. So that was the reason why, for example, in our case, we were interested in looking at the Renaissance, but there was also documentation of intelligence that we have sort of, you know, sort of absorbed and we've have fed the discipline throughout all these centuries and do that. But then we are facing with a kind of, you know, sort of this idea of intelligence that is not only particular to architecture, but as you were saying, it's particular to other disciplines. And I think that's really the kind of the weaving thread that is kind of bringing all this discussion together. The fact that intelligence is this new conception of intelligence has really brought all these other disciplines together and we sort of operate with that. So I think that's the kind of discovery of the sort of, of what is it now to, to talk about intelligence in, in the new world in a way that all these collaborative aspects of it, maybe as part of the Anthropocene as, as, as Alexander was saying, but there's, there's really sort of um, this renowned interest in those things. And I think also, the kind of new dis descriptions or definitions of what we call computation are no longer just generative or 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 sort of or, or, or imp of improvement or achievement it has to do with the idea of collaborative. So thinking together is there's these new ways of thinking of what computation you know sort of is is seen. So I think it's really interesting to think of what intelligence is today, what computation could be today, and those are sort of as as Ben was saying, they're kind of prevailing questions that we are asking ourselves in, order, in all our in all our research. Yeah, I agree with the notion of collaboration. I think, you know, in the work that we've been doing recently, we've been building VR games where there is that aspect of networking where you can bring people like the same way if you want during the pandemic that Zoom and these other platform brought people together to have conversation. We're seeing like how we can turn this and use it in, uh, for example, in VR networking where you can bring different uh, professionals, but also different communities and have a discussion going, uh, um, you know, a way of uh, facilitate discussion with different parts of the world, different knowledges that would come together and maybe something different would form or um, the I think the conversation that we are having now or the conversation that uh, Victoria was uh, talking about that happened over six days are really where you know, the um, juice of all of that is, is really how to exchange ideas because we are all you know, uh, expert in our uh, research and very uh, believe a lot in the work we do. And you know, we could talk about AI computation and all of these things. But I think what's interesting is when we are confronted with different views and we're uh, understanding you know, how um, it relates to people that work in architecture and fashion, people that work with narrative and post-anthropocenic scenarios, the people who come from media art and how we can all have a conversation and broaden the way, um, broaden the architecture discipline and extend it beyond what it's uh, defined as, you know, as we would see it like 20 years ago, I would say. Uh, thank you, Yara. Uh, I, I wanna fit in Alexander and then uh, Lisa, if you don't mind. So uh, Alex, do you wanna to respond to speculative intelligence or what you see intelligence being so far? <clears throat> Thank you. I'd, I'd love to. Um, and I'll try to, to also weed in th weave in threads to Ben's question. Um, I think that this idea of thinking together, uh, the machine and the human kind of collaboratively um, processing information and, and designing together is super fascinating. And I love the idea of, of, of design, digital futures being a series of neurons that have been produced a sort of collective uh, neural net as uh, a fascinating provocation. Um, I think one of the th one of the things that that we as designers frequently overlook is the issue of 
communication um, in terms of how do we actually communicate with machines to respond to what Ben was asking. I see a fundamental difference between uh, computational design and, um, and GAN produced design as really being um, a, a method of communication. I think that there's obviously very significant um, mechanisms in place for how the machine processes that information. But if computational design was sort of being, was or parametric design was feeding the machine parameters, which were abstractions of a physical context to then design relative to that. In GAN, we're, we're feeding the machine information, but it's in the information of, of images. So it's a very different kind of image format and very different kind of information. And therefore there's a, a kind of a, um, a neural structure that responds very differently to that information. But in both of those cases, we're still abstracting the physical environment and, and producing something to the machine. And I think it's really important as designers that we always keep um, in mind, what are useful abstractions and what are incredibly um, uh, dangerous ones? And to me, a lot of my work is really pushing on um, on kind of how do we actually build um, neural networks to actually recreate space and, and engage with space directly rather than providing it simulations, but actually trying to provide more robust um, communications of that partially to, to help that communication process. But I think it's also really worth um, mentioning that we are really challenged on being able to have the machine communicate back to us what the meaningful the meaningful design responses are, are um, with the, the with data visualization. So the the kind of the ideas of data smog, um, the you you know, Yoon's workshop produced incredibly compelling visualizations, and some of that data is incredibly useful to be presented graphically. But a lot of data sets that we deal with as designers resist that capacity for us to be presented data smog information and then be able to do something meaningful with it. Um, so I, I think that that the our capacity of designers is actually to pick and choose which, how we communicate with the machine, what kind of information is actually um, communicatable through different mechanisms, and then being able to respond differently to that. Parametricism arguably couldn't respond to aesthetics the same way that GAN does, um, but can GAN respond to things like uh, material and resource use the same way that parametric engines could. Uh, thank, thank you, Alex, for your uh, detailed um, answer and you know um, thoughts. Uh, I would uh, turn to now Lisa and Victoria. Lisa, do you have any thoughts on intelligence, material intelligence, and working in groups? So Lisa, take it away. Hi. Um, I really like the concept that was shared um, about the way that the uh, it can bring people together from all around the world um, and different disciplines, particularly. I like that idea of, it's my dog. Well, it, yeah, it's, his name is Benny. Um, but just bringing people um, together from all around the world and, and different disciplines together. Um, I like the idea of kind of creating a language that is a little bit more universal between disciplines because it's a language that's being created um, through collaboration. So for example, um, the work that is shared by um, Iris's fashion studio and Philip's architecture studio, um, the pattern language that is created um, was created together and is therefore shared and a little bit more universal between those two disciplines. Um, which ha have always anyway had quite a close connection with each other. Um, but I really like how moving forwards, um, so, so not just for fashion and architecture, um, but um, like installation and art design, how um, it's a platform that brings all of these disciplines together. Um, and then moving forwards, they can create, an, I guess, kind of a universal language together because, um, um, because it's a joint creation. Um, yeah, just the opportunities that are created um, that wouldn't have been possible before um, because uh, yeah, just uh, global global collaborations, that kind of thing. Um, yeah. uh, thank you, Lisa. Uh, Victoria, let's hear from you and then Shane. 
Yes, thank you. Um, I actually wanted to pick up uh, on something that Alexander um, mentioned um, that, you know, I think there's different systems of um, data processing. And I think it is very important for us as designers to also kind of challenge um, the tools and the technology that we work with. And I wanted to uh, just raise one question or uh, interesting concept that is actually uh, uh, mentioned by David Eagleman, who is a neuroscientist and uh, researcher from California. And he's actually making the uh, interesting point that machines so far are not, do not have a, um, the thrive to survive. And uh, he's making the, um, the comparison between a Mars rover and a wolf. And so he's saying if the Mars rover actually gets stuck on Mars and it's, you know, its wheel gets entangled somewhere, it will just give up. Whereas if a wolf would get entangled the same way, I mean, this is speculative, of course, we have to think about it as a, uh, a Gedanken experiment. Um, so it's the wolf would actually gnaw its paw off in order to um, yeah, find a way to escape. And it, it is interesting that I think you know, we have to keep these kind of concepts in mind when we work with machines that organisms and embodied intelligence still to this day is um, superior to, uh, to machines. But at the same time, we're working so closely in relationship with them that we sometimes inherit certain biases. And I think there can be an interesting um, dialogue happening, um, but we still have to kind of keep in mind and challenge ourselves to not inherit too much of the biases from the machines. So I think it's an interesting um, kind of challenge uh, that the machine faces, but also we face with working with the machine. So this entire balance that we have to uh, kind of keep up as, as people, I myself work a lot with technology as well. So I see that as a, as a challenge uh, for myself sometimes to kind of step back and as a human being sometimes think about these kind of um, you know, challenges that we face. So that is, that is my contribution to intelligence. Uh, th thank you, Victoria, for your thoughts. Shane, I think I uh, want to hear about your thoughts on intelligence, but also I think we're going to start wrapping it up so you can actually give your uh, both what's intelligence and then your thoughts on the experience. Yeah, no, I, I think touching, I'll, I'll keep this relatively brief, but um, touching on what Alexander was saying with issues of uh, architectural agency, I think... Um, this is sort of the the best platform to disseminate knowledge on um, and we'll only really gain agency in terms of uh, artificial neural nets uh, through the really intentional layering of them and the creation of workflows because as, as you had stated previously the the input to these data sets are relatively limiting like there there is um, you know PyTorch 3D but just something that's voxel ba base is inherently limiting. So you utilizing like um, vector displacement maps as an input or utilizing sections, um, I, I, I think is really sort of interesting. So it's like a ton of constraints and a ton of different solutions to the problem. And that's, that's the whole intention of us uh, sharing a kind of rudimentary workflow uh, and a lot of tools so you can, or the, the participants and the studios that the participants are teaching, um, uh, the sort of uh, digital arsenal that we provided them with can start to be uh, a little bit more disseminated. Uh, thank you, Shane. Uh, I'm gonna invite uh, uh, Professor Gabriel Esquivel. Uh, can you please uh, give us some of your thoughts, final thoughts, but also maybe some reflections? Yeah, I mean, thank you, first of all. Thank you, thanks, 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 Neil. Thanks, Gustavo, for inviting us. This is really terrific. Um, I think, I think, yeah, so as, as Khalid has stated that a collaborative sort of um, um, ecosystem is really important and new definitions about what we call intelligence and all that. But I think something that was mentioned, um, that was not really mentioned, that was really important to us is also really that the data, the interpretation of this data through all the different means that we're sort of using, let's say through style GANs and et cetera, there's inherent 
the notion that there's an aesthetic value, there's an aesthetic regime that's being presented. So even in the work that Yara was talking about, there's really a sense of messiness and all that. And some of the questions that were posted on the chat, so we're saying Yara was, Yoon was asking us is really, is there a refinement of, of this idea of the aesthetics? And to me, that's really, the, the importance of it, that this brings us also to engage a new regime of aesthetics that are not sort of only speculative, but they're really part of the process, right? And at the same time for us, it's not really that we're justifying the aesthetics because we are using a certain workflow that justifies the way things look. I think to me, it's also important to say that within the process, there's nothing to fear about the idea that we can propose aesthetically something and we can work back and forth. So the intelligence of the aesthetics is really not only sort of driven by the machine itself and, and the separation of the operator or the art of the designer, but is really the crossover from that. So to me, the aesthetic regime, the aesthetic agenda is something that is really, really important that is really, you know, sort of that we see in all of this work and is not something to me that is justifiable just because it's really part of a, a workflow. It is also part that is defining where we the stage of, you know, so the moment that we are today and we can embrace it back and forth and not be shy about or apprehensive, which I think is really a lot of the reception of this work that I've seen through all this other uh, sort of colleagues, et cetera, that they are sort of hesitant about that, you know, and the accepted unless is justifiable through a certain process, a technological or technical process. So for me, that's another aspect that we, that we can touch in another session, but I think that's really something that is quite relevant in my point of view. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor, for your uh, reflections and thoughts. I wanted to invite Yara also to give her reflections and thoughts and maybe kind of, uh, kind of a, a brief overview and experience. So yeah. Yara? Thank you. Yeah, thank you again, everybody. It was uh, so great to be part of the conversation and uh, be able to do the workshop with the amazing students we've had. And I want to continue on Gabrielle's point, because I think that, as I was discussing with Neil earlier, that there is a different use of AI. And I think maybe mostly what we've seen is uh, style transfer and GANs and all of that. And I find this, you know, fascinating and I can only be alone, like lured in by, uh, you know, the aesthetics and how um, beautiful and intriguing and novel it looks. But I would say that there's a different parts of AI. And I think this is what my work has been focusing on the last two years, I would say it's shifted from um, the aesthetic interest of like the aesthetic output that AI could generate. Uh, it's still there, but I'm moving towards using AI in simulation, in behavioral AI that would really engender things, not only through their aesthetic, but also through their processes through which they work. And that I think is extremely helpful to uh, rethink the way we think about architecture in terms of not only the aesthetic, which would you know um, mean that we are looking at architecture as a facade, as a surface, but really understanding architecture through workflow, uh, sorry, through flows of movement, through behaviors of people inside of it, and really touching on that neural science interest in AI. And I find this incredibly interesting. And I don't think it puts apart the aesthetics. The aesthetics are as important, but I think it's important to mention that intelligence and AI is not something that only is aesthetics, uh, has an aesthetic result, but it's something that could be ingrained within the processes and the generation of uh, like could, could generate shapes, but also could generate the logic of movement through building and the logic of behavior of different entities within the building, which I find really fascinating because, you know, it really takes away that um, uh, dichotomy between us, the machine, and it creates that gray in between, with, which is why I talk about messiness and dirtiness, because it really complicates things and it, it complexifies things and it makes it harder to digest, harder to under, understand. But I think this is where you take the time to dive into it and you take the time to unpack it. And this is, for me, very, very important. So it's like a close reading, which would enable you to take more time to unpack, but in um, yeah, looking at AI systems. Um, but it was a fantastic workshop and I love meeting all of you and having this discussion. And thank you so much, Gustavo, for um, yeah, giving me the mic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, well, oh, thank you very much, Yara, for your thoughts. I want to invite Lisa for her final thoughts and reflections and then uh, Alex. 
Uh, take it away, Lisa. Um, yeah, I just wanted to thank everybody again for the opportunity. Um, it was really great to, to meet everybody um, and to hear about um, all the projects and the students work. Um, yeah, in particular, um, it was so interesting to see um, the students' um, reactions and um, reflections in like a short time period um, to the presentations that were given. Um, yeah, just um, how the, the same idea and the same concept can be taken by, um, by different students um, and like the, the, the variety of results that came out um, from the workshops. Um, and I, yeah, I'm just really looking forward to seeing um, what they come up with next um, after these workshops. Uh, thank you, Lisa. Uh, Alex, uh, your thoughts and reflections? Yeah, I'll try to uh, uh, offer them in, in not quite as a detailed way. I apologize to everyone if I'm talking too much. Um, but it's it my my thoughts are are really um, it's just such an amazing collection of work and so many different um, uh, approaches that are packed in into this. And it's it's just been a wonderful two hours, just two and a half hours to see what everyone has produced. Um, I think um, something that's really interesting to me um, uh, is the, the work that Yara is doing by, by using digital images to capture messiness, to capture um, the, the, the kind of, to try to start to abstract behavior into an image format, I think is really compelling and the, um, the 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 kind of going back to Ben's question of what is what makes this era or this epoch of of computational design different than computational design that preceded it? Um, certainly, you know, messiness, behavior, things like that are very difficult um, information sets to abstract and present to a machine. The um, you know the the sloppiness of someone's couch and the fact that. Um, dogs pop in behind our Zoom backgrounds and things like that are really much more kind of the the, the dynamism and the actual the the actual giving material to the machine that can start to start to quantify and respond to the messiness of in architectural use and how we actually live as people and I, I feel like um, or at least some of us I'm pretty messy so that, that it, maybe it's just me um, but I think that 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 is a really interesting contribution I think that what's really striking to me is how everyone is not just um, d presenting work that's that's relevant um, and and kind of topical, but then is 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 presenting it in a very critical way. Um, and I could probably talk about every group. And I, again, I'm trying not to be too detailed. I apologize. But um, but th that was one instance that really jumps out to me is why not only are, is this group using digital technology in a very progressive way, but there's a criticality to it that is um, really advancing the practice in, um, in a, what I think is very productive, a pr very productive way. Well, thank you very much, uh, Alex. And, uh, you know, I guess that, you know, we're gonna continue this discussion in the future. And I want to basically um, call on Victoria to give her final thoughts and provocations and end with Neil. Uh, uh, Neil Leach um, has inspired me, but inspired countless others. And uh, there's a lot on our agenda. We're looking for people to come on board. So if you know of any good people, please uh, send them our way. But Take it away, Victoria. What are your thoughts and what do you want to leave us with today? <laughs> Thank you. I, um, I was really astonished to see all the work and I think all of you are already pushing the envelope, pun intended. So I think it's, uh, it's, it's really beautiful to see how uh, each of you is really developing this, this in, insane you know, dimension or new dimension of work that is really going beyond and pushing the boundaries, as, as Neil said earlier. And I think, I mean, it is interesting if you think about that the, the definition of self and the, the def definition of boundary is always connected to something that is kind of um, adjacent or overlapping or intruding. So I think all of us um, are thinking here again together. And I think that is how we define um, the path forward. So no one can do it alone. Um, I think we as humans are social beings. So I think it's, it's a beautiful thing that um, this platform gives us the opportunity to really think together and um, kind of push the dialogue and the projects forward. So thank you everyone for sharing your work with us today. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Victoria. So I think we're going to uh, 
end today's session with Neil and some of his provocations or observations. So Neil, take it away. Yeah, I just wanted to mention something which you, none of you would have perhaps known about, but uh, what I found interesting <clears throat> in part about today's session is we had Alex Webb here, who was part of the European Graduate School Initiative that we set up years ago, um, which is a very interesting thing in itself. It was up, stuck up in, in Sasfe, the most beautiful, exquisite mount, uh, uh, village in the mountains in Switzerland. And we, there was a kind of a, a PhD program going on there where Slavoj Žižek and, and uh, others, uh, Sapod Quinta and, and Mamel Delanda, were all part of in, in a kind of curious way. And uh, that, uh, that was, uh, there was a digital design program there, but that was shut down, but it's still, there's a more general pro program going there. But the second iteration of that was actually the digital futures things when we brought uh, Akim and, and, and Samford and, and, and others into this into the fold once more uh, and this summer we of course we had we had uh, Zizek as well so I mean, and then a further iteration was the, was the FIU one which which one of our, our presenters today is, is on as well so the, what I find interesting is, is, is that there is this kind of um, uh, uh, a kind of a, a, a doctoral research program, which is completely interdisciplinary, that's been underpinning that, and what we've been trying to do this summer, which is something we're not going to talk about in, in the in the workshops. But I think the, the the digital consortium, which was an attempt, which is again was built upon that, as an attempt to bring everyone together with many of those European graduate school professors uh, like Gigi as part of that. That's maybe the kind of next the next iteration of that, and, and you know I think that that. Um, it's it's just great to see this is ongoing open research that's opening architecture up in 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 a really important way to ideas from other disciplines. But I just want to say one final thing to get to, to respond to Gabe in some ways. Going back to Celia, and of course my experience was Alberti was actually those in those days in the times of Alberti everything was all together. Alberti was an artist, was a sculptor, was an architect, was a philosopher, was a mathematician a sociologist and so on and, and, and likewise i don't know someone like uh, michelangelo was, was many different disciplines so in some ways we're getting back to that sort of dynamic quality that really uh, really made the renaissance such an ex incredible thing so maybe there is a kind of renaissance that's happening now that's coming out of all these these things which is drawing in on the technology but um i i just want to finish by saying this was this was so fascinating to me to see what was going on in these workshops and it was it, and and it kind of, it's reassuring to me that I think there's a, a huge amount that we can offer to open up these ideas, not only to other people in other different workshops, but across the world. And, you know, I think that's, that's a fabulous thing uh, to have, you know, Ahmed here in, 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 in Egypt and so on, and, and to be able to have this discussion going because it's a, it was incredibly rich. And I think it's a, laying the foundations for something else in the future. I just want to thank Gustavo for his, for his hard look and indeed the rest of the team, the iceberg team that, that are working behind the scenes, making everything work, um, Virginia and, and so on, and the, the support team in China. It's, it, it, it doesn't happen out of nowhere. And there's a lot of good work that's coming, that, that's, that's a lot of hard work, that's voluntary work that's been invested in this. But I can see the benefits of that. I hope we all can now, because I think this is really an interesting discussion that will carry on. So uh, thank you very much for presenting. Thank you so much for, for doing the workshops. I mean, and, and for entering into the spirit, really, of, of trying to, um, uh, it, share ideas uh, around the world, um, and uh, and thank you for the presentation present today. So so it's been amazing. Um, I just wish I want to say I just wish I'd known about Yara's work beforehand because I didn't know about this. But you know this is what you know. I think that from now on, you know, we we're now connected, and I think that there are there you know I think opening up architecture in a really healthy and productive way. Um, so thank you. Well, well, thank you, everyone. I think we're coming to a close. I'm not sure if Philip wants to say anything because he's he's uh, he's been here. But um, if Philip is uh, won't say um, won't make closing remarks, I wanted to say thank you, thank you very much for your time for volunteering. The students are deeply appreciative. I would have loved to take in probably every workshop, but um, it's it's been an honor. So thank you very much. So if there's no closing statements, does anyone wanna say any closing remarks? I think we're done. Again, thank you again. So say hi, uh, say hi to everyone or goodbye, and then we're gonna wrap it up. So bye-bye everyone. Thank you, Gustavo.